so guys, that's me just heading off to the BBC studios along from the Glasgow River Clyde. As you can see, this is a big Glasgow squinty bridge. This is the River Clyde, the famous River Clyde. So every, you can see all the traffic flying about, so I'm just going to take you along there guys and let you see how I got on. Hopefully it will go well, we'll speak to you soon. So guys, look at just how amazing the River Clyde is. Quite murky, but this is a big bridge you can see away up here, as you'll see. This is the one they always talk about, the big squinty bridge and things like that. It's right up in front of us. What I was wanting to talk about, guys, was all this kind of carry-on that's going on in the vegan community at the moment. It's, it's quite disgusting, actually, like I say. You've got people suing each other and you've got people hating on each other, you've got people obviously harassing and things like that. And it's absolutely disgusting guys because this is, if you don't know obviously Roman Millennial, I've seen quite a bit of her recent videos obviously talking about how vegans are obviously quite <laughs> disgusting in nature. That's one thing I would totally agree with, she's really got a great great point there guys because when you look online and you see all the nature of veganism and things like that and the kind of the hate that goes on and such, no wonder people obviously get put off by going vegan because they think that every vegan is like that. Well, that's far from the truth, like I say. There's some amazing vegans out there. It's just like any community. You're going to have assholes in every community, let's face it, guys. It's not going to be any different no matter where you are. But she had some good points and she had some bad points. Obviously she was saying that basically we ram veganism down everybody's throat and things like that. I suppose it can seem like that when you're a non-vegan, but is it not just as much them ramming animal products down our, our throat? You look on national TV and you see free for one deals and McDonald's and every single advert has got an animal product in it. But we don't go on about that. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about compassion for all. She did have some great points, like saying a lot of vegans actually prioritise an animal's life over a human's life, and that can be true, like I say. We see it a lot, especially online recently, with people with eating disorders when they haven't been able to go vegan, or they've had to give it up because of all the kind of deficiencies and how hard it is to actually recover from an eating disorder already but when you're going vegan and in recovery it's even a lot lot harder because a lot of people do use it as a mask for their eating disorder most people like I say can rec can recover but I've always said I don't recommend it because at the end of the day you've really got to look at are you doing it for the ethical reasons or are you doing it because you want to obviously restrict, that's that's one thing you've really got to look at. But like I say, they turn on people and things like that, you've seen that often. But they'll say, oh, go and die and all this, and how should animals die because for you to thrive and things. This is the kind of crap that goes on. But she had some good points and she had some bad points, like I say. I'll maybe do a video on it, but that's the kind of things I wanted to cover. I'm just going to, this is a big... Uh, Glasgow Science Centre there as well guys it's absolutely beautiful beautiful day here look it's quite kind of grey skies but it's really really clear you've got the Glasgow barge boats and things like that all the traffic flying along that's the Kingston Bridge there in Glasgow so I'm just going to walk along hopefully I'll get there very very soon I'll speak to you all soon guys So guys, that's it, STV Studios, but I've still got quite a bit to go yet. I've got a good walk, it's about three miles for the actual train station, so I'm hoping to get there shortly. <laughs> oh, but look, I hope you can see better, this is a new camera I'm actually using at the moment. So, that's the big Glasgow Science Centre just right there, if you can see it. That's it right there. So. I'll speak to you, this is also another famous landmark in Scotland, the SSE Hydro. 
this is where they hold a lot of the big concerts and things like that, Robbie Williams, WWE wrestling and such likes. So guys, that's me just arrived. That's the famous Glasgow Rangers Stadium in the background. BBC Scotland. Finally arrived. So I'll speak to you all soon, I'm just gonna head on in. So guys, that's me just arrived at the BBC studios, got my pass and things like that. That's as far as I can obviously take you from here because I'm obviously not allowed to video record but I'll speak to you all soon and I'll let you know how it went guys and hopefully it'll be on the BBC iPlayer as well. Speak to you soon, send you all my love. So guys, that's me just back for the Kay Adams show, it absolutely went great. She was absolutely amazing, like I say, she touched upon a lot of things. Obviously we touched upon things like the veganism as well. As well. The professor that was in who's a psychologist, he was talking about how we need to start treating the eating disorder and the person rather than just the BMI, which was absolutely great to hear. Some great, great points and it was a thoroughly, thoroughly proud moment to actually be a part of this and raise awareness. It'll actually be online as well, I think, so I'll probably put the links below, but I'll speak to you all very, very soon. Mornings with Kay Adams on BBC Radio Scotland. Now, singer Zayn Malik and cricketer Freddie Flintov are two of the high-profile males to speak out about their battles with eating disorders. Uh, but recent figures suggest that they may be part of a growing trend. A 27% increase in men seeking help for anorexia, bulimia and other problem eating disorders has been recorded in England over the past three years, which is twice the level of the increase that's been seen in women. So here to speak a bit more about this and to hopefully pick apart what's going on. We've got uh, Tommy Kelly uh, who's with us. Tofu, uh, Tofu Tommy uh, is your YouTube character, Tommy. Uh, welcome and thanks very much, thanks for, very much. for coming in. Um, and we've also got Professor Ewan Gillen, who's a counselling psychologist and clinical director for Psychology Scotland. Uh, so thanks to you as well, Ewan. Um, these figures relate to, to England, Ewan. Are there any reason to believe that they will be radically different from uh, the rest of the UK? No, not at all. Um, I think there's a growing trend generally toward um, men with eating disorders being more visible um, and that is recorded in the figures that you're, you're talking about. Whether it's because the problem is growing um, or whether it's simply because it's becoming more seen and diagnosed is the question. I suspect a bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly I think it's, it's a trend that we'll see increasing over the, the coming years. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly it is, uh, well, eating disorders do tend to be discussed in a fairly female context, don't they? Uh, yes. and, and certainly even in terms of the recent reaction, and, and I'm, I'm mentioning Zane uh, Malik and Freddie Flintoff purely because in the last two weeks they have been in the, the popular press discussing their own kind of battles uh, with eating disorders. And that in itself is seen as unusual, isn't it? It still is seen unusual uh, as unusual. Men are still often thought about as as not having a problem with their bodies, and of course that's simply not the case. And you know, um, Tommy will talk about his experience uh, soon. But it's it's a growing problem for many, many men. But of course, with men, it's different to with women. With women, often it's around the female body t sort of ideal in some ways, which is um, slender, light, whereas with men it kind of goes both ways. Some men orientate towards being smaller, but of course there's, with men, the muscular sort of Adonis type ideal male body type also encourages men to, to bulk up and be big. And so we see men struggling with their bodies also who are large, who want to be bigger, stronger, take steroids, manage their bodies, over-exercise in that regard. So it's a slightly different kettle of fish when it comes to, to men than perhaps traditionally it's been associated with women. Mm. Well, the, the other aspect, and again, we, we've discussed it a number of times on, on the programmes, more usually, not exclusively in relation to women, but more usually, and, and that really difficult conundrum as to what is really at the root of an eating disorder. Is it about, you know, one's body and one's self-image and, and one's ideal of what, what one would want to be? Or is it a measure of control that could actually be related to 
other kind of mental health challenges that somebody has and it manifests itself through a, a need to control eating. And, and I guess it's going to be different in, in different cases. Um, Tommy, do you mind telling us what your experience is with, with your eating? Yeah, well, my eating disorder obviously started in 1997 with a loss of my mum. She'd suffered long-term ovarian cancer in the wound from having me. I was actually a semi-professional footballer at the time. I was gradually doing things like 15 hours exercise a day, up through the night, constantly doing weights, going out runs, basically hiding it from my father, who was still alive at that point. I was, over the next three years, I was from 1997 right through to 2000, I was going back and forward to the doctors, actually saying that I was losing a lot of weight, but I was thinking I was getting fitter, I was, I was surviving in things like an apple and filling myself up in fizzy juice just to give myself that illusion of being full. I actually went away to Australia in the year 2000. I was, I'm not going to say the weight because I don't want to trigger anybody, but I was away down to a very, very low weight. Arriving off the plane at Glasgow after a six-month visa, I took a massive heart attack and I was passed away for nine minutes. How old were you then, Tommy? I was 20 at that point. 20? Yes, uh, I lost all my footballing career and things because of it. I was actually in a potassium coma for three months. I woke up and I actually thought I had a near-death experience. I woke up and it was like clouds and I said to the nurse, am I in heaven? Because it was all misty. And she says, you've actually suffered a major heart attack. She says, and she ran out and got all the nurses. She says, you've been in a potassium coma. And they didn't actually think I was going to come around. And this was directly linked to malnourishment? Yeah, it was basically, as a form, I blamed myself for my mum's passing because I found out, obviously, that she had obviously had the choice of having me and living with the cancer or of aborting me and being free of the cancer and, and I blamed myself so much about it and that was the catalyst for my eating disorder that and obviously my grandfather passing the month before her it was basically he was I could tell him everything he was basically my, my best friend and things so i done that and I, I recovered up to about 12 and a half stone from 2002 and I met my wife we actually married in 2006 and at that point she suffered a a lot of miscarriages. She suffered like four miscarriages. It was misdiagnosed as polycystic ovarian syndrome. It actually turned out to be ovarian cancer and she had to have a full hysterectomy. So I relapsed at that point and I actually was passed away for six minutes this time. That was my second massive heart attack and it was my wife that actually found me in the house, luckily enough, and they only got my heart started by inserting a drain into my lung and bringing me back. I got back out of the hospital and I actually get community care in the, the, a community care setting, which is really, really hard to find because it's like a postcode lottery to actually get any help. I was up to about seven and a half stone, but I couldn't really ever get to the point of actually recovering. Up to seven and a half stone. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely appreciate, Tommy, you're very wary of giving out, you know, very low weights, and I totally appreciate that. Yep. But I think anyone will know that, that a young man who was formerly a semi-professional footballer to talk about being up to seven and a half exactly. stone, you, we, we've got some idea of the gravity of the situation. Yeah, so I didn't really get to the point of recovering because my father was actually suffering from long-term diabetes. He actually had a stroke and he was paralysed all right down the right side. Me and my wife were looking after him and he actually passed away in November 2014 after a second stroke and massive heart attack. I went into hospital because I'd relapsed. I was suffering from like renal failure and refeeding syndrome. Basically, refeeding syndrome is when they start to introduce calories to your body. Your body goes into shock and can actually bring on a heart attack and things like that. But at this point, I actually recovered. Recovery really seemed to happen. I, it was just like something that clicked on me that I knew that I had to live again and start actually speaking out about things. I started my YouTube channel, started speaking at, from Eating Disorder Awareness Week at Parliament. And it's... I went obviously vegan, but like I say, I don't recommend people that's eating disorders go vegan because it can be the worst thing they can do because a lot of people do use it as a mask for their eating disorder. It allows, I suppose, for restrictions, doesn't it? Exactly. A restriction is built into to yeah. that diet. Just then trying to to get to, to the link, I mean, Ewan was talking about young men becoming much more conscious of their, their body shapes these days in yep. a way that is perhaps more typical of, of women, and that's a matter of concern. But the way that you tell your story, it doesn't sound as if that was part of, of your story. For you, it was a response to some very real trauma and grief that was happening in your life yeah it was like a, it's just like a coping mechanism you actually think you're dealing with the situation but you're not you're actually costing yourself your life you restrict yourself from everything isolate yourself away from family friends you 
you, your, your cognitive abilities are not there. You just can't think straight and you just get caught up in that cycle. It's only when you actually start accepting you've got a problem and actually want to get help, that's actually when you start to recover. And for me, that's what it's about. My, my father always said to me before he passed, don't recover for me, do it for yourself. And that's what I think... I was trying to do a lot in the past was mm. want to do it for other people rather than doing it for myself and this time I really want to. But in terms of your response to, as I say, really, really difficult times in your life, the, the death of, of, of your mum and your wife experiencing miscarriages when you said you, you had a relapse, I suppose people faced with those kind of events in their lives uh, might uh, become depressed, uh, they might turn to alcohol, you know, they yeah. might try and find a number of coping mechanisms. Why do you think that your response was to restrict your food? I think it was because of me being an athlete in the past and that's what I was all about, about being that kind of ideal weight and things like that. I was always into nutrition. I even went down the road of steroids, which we just talked about earlier on at one point. I was I was into that. I was doing a lot of things like obviously binging and purging where I was eating a lot of food, making myself sick. I got into laxative abuse. I ended up having a prolapse bill, which to this day I've got to actually rely on laxatives prescribed by the doctor because my bills just don't work properly because of that as well so that's what I want to say to people it's, it's a vicious circle and like I say people out there they don't want to speak out but it's I always say it's okay not to be okay because a lot of people think it's a weakness admitting you're not okay and, but it's actually a strength because you're actually taking back the control for your eating disorder and showing you actually want to get help but I say people out there are suffering every single day and we need to start raising awareness and ending the stigma that it's this white girl privileged illness because eating disorders don't discriminate against anybody whether it's male, female, whether you're rich, poor, whatever ethnic background mm -hmm. you come from. Yeah, and I suppose that um, act of taking back control on all sorts of levels might be perceived as being even more difficult for blokes because, as you say, it's not seen in it. It's clearly yeah. a very complex relationship. You will come come right back to you after this. Joe Nesbo is best known for his crime novels about Detective Harry Hooley. He's a very intense character and you sort of have to have breaks from him. The Nordic author talks to Edie about his writing. It's like, you know, going into a room and just shutting the door from then on. It's just me and my characters. And the many influences that have shaped both his life and his novels. Because your parents had very different wartime experiences. My father, he thought that three years in jail was a fair punishment for being as wrong as he had been. Stark Talk with Joe Nesbo. Your first choice of career, there was a footballer. People seem to remember me now as actually better than I was. <laughs> Tomorrow at 1.30 on BBC Radio Scotland. It's 10.26. This is Kay Adams with you up until 12. Joined in the studio this morning by Tommy Kelly, who... Uh, has, as he's been explaining, for, for long periods of his life with um, sort of relapse and remissions, if I can say, battled with eating disorders. Um, also joined by Professor Ewan Gillen, who's a counselling psychologist and a clinical director for Psychology Scotland, who was just saying that these figures that have come out uh, in England, that there's a 27% increase in men seeking help for anorexia, bulimia and other problem eating disorders are likely to be replicated uh, across the UK and indeed in Scotland and there has been um, whether or not an increase in men having eating disorders or a heightened visibility of those men that's uh, that's a question but but you just picking up from what Tommy was saying and and I'm help me unpick this in my brain so it's not a simple relationship between I want to look like that person I don't look like that person and therefore I am going to um, get into a severe or a a drastic dieting cycle to do it because as Tommy was saying it was very much in reaction to real grief and bereavement in his life you know yeah. talk a bit more about that and what you see as the links yeah I mean I think there's two aspects to any kind of difficulty there's the behaviors and then there's the underlying I guess emotional pain that people have and the two interact um, um, Tommy has explained his story and you can hear the, the many many traumas he's had to deal with and come to terms with in his life and his way of coping which fitted into how he lived at the time was mm -hmm. to work that through 
taking control of his body via exercise and dieting and, and of that in turn becoming a cycle that was very difficult yeah. to break. And emotional pain is at the root of mental health. And when we struggle with things emotionally, we do things to cope that are often unhelpful to us. And eating disorders are no different. So what always underlines an eating disorder, which is a, effectively a set of behaviours that inform how we relate to our body and what we do with our body, is pain that may be based on how we feel about ourselves, some perceptions we might have as about being not good enough, um, things that might have happened to us, perhaps we were bullied at school, teased for particular reasons, injured, um, horrible things that have happened to us. So there's things that happen in our lives. And then, of course, there's also our personalities. People differ in their personalities, and some people are more just more likely because of their genes and their, their kind of the way they are to perhaps be, be vulnerable to, to struggling in some way and more sensitive, perhaps. So it's the interaction between our experiences and, and our emotional life and how we cope with it, our behaviours that then can create and maintain a cycle that can become over time an eating disorder. And it's when it becomes, I guess, out of control um, and it can build up and build up, that's when it becomes more problematic. And of course, that's why it's important to intervene early and why it's important for this kind of discussion to happen. Because if we are identifying that men do struggle with eating, do struggle with their bodies in different ways. And that's something we can talk about and men feel free to go and seek help for. And it's not something that's dismissed or it's not, not recognised because sometimes it's, you know, if you see a, a strong, muscular male sitting in front of you, it's quite difficult to get your head around the fact that they may be actually struggling and feeling very out of control because they appear the exact opposite. And do you think we still have a problem with public perception of, of eating disorders? Absolutely. I think there's a huge perception of eating disorders because of the history being associated with women and seen as a female problem and also seen as about being small and light. And certainly that's a really important part of eating difficulties for men. But it's not the only part. And there's many, many men who struggle, who are very bulky and big, struggle away to control their bodies and manage things in, in very different ways. So uh, Tommy was saying that he's, and we'll talk about this in, in a minute, we just need to catch up with, with travel. Tommy's very keen to sort of get this discussion out in the open. Um, do you think that's important? I do, and I think that Tommy's story and Tommy's preparedness to come and, and be open in this way is, 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 is fantastic because it does give permission to other people who are perhaps struggling similarly to think, that well, that's an inspiration there. I, I can perhaps ask for help or even start talking about how I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing because one of the key features of eating disorders is, is secrecy and not, not wanting to, to tell other people, not wanting to seek help. So people like Tommy talking about it and being open about their experiences and, and, and their resilience being really clear. They've come yeah. through something that's terrible and they're now able to, to help others and I think that's something that's absolutely admirable and incredibly important. Well, listen, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about it uh, after we've caught up with the, the travel. Victoria's on the travel. Hi, Victoria. Hi, good morning. As we've been hearing this morning in Dundee, an ongoing police incident on Lawton Terrace means this and surrounding roads have been closed by police, so you'll have to divert. In Perth and Kinross, traffic is still slow on the northbound A9, going through the roadworks there, approaching the Inveram and roundabouts. In North Lanarkshire, another set of roadworks causing problems. This set is on the, the A725 North Road, and that's causing delays in both directions at the A8 Glasgow and Edinburgh Road at the Shawhead flyover. In North Lanarkshire, the A73 Motherwell Road has queues northbound with delays there of around 10 minutes. In Edinburgh, Calder Road had been closed because of an earlier collision. I've been told the, the road is now open again westbound and traffic is moving. And disruption to trains this morning is continuing. Overhead wire problems at Newton Lanark means delays and cancellations on several routes. Dalmuir and Lark Hall, Glasgow Central and Edinburgh via Shots, Glasgow Central and Lanark, Cumbernauld and Dalmuir via Motherwell and and Lark Hall and Mulgai. Trains aren't expected to run normally until at least one o'clock. BBC Radio Scotland Travel. Thanks very much, Victoria. Just gone 10.32. We're talking about uh, a significant increase in men look, seeking treatment and help with eating disorders, um, whether that is because there are more men uh, experiencing eating disorders or men feeling more able to come forward and, and ask for help is as yet unknown and more research clearly needing to be done on that. But uh, we've got Professor Ewan Gillen with us and also Tommy Kelly for much of his adult life had battled with eating disorders saying it is important that this conversation does take place and that men do know uh, that 
it is something that affects men and that they are able to, to come forward. And, and on that light, uh, Tommy, you, you have uh, self side yourself as Tofu Tommy. Yes. Um, and you're out there online and uh, you, you're talking about it a lot. What kind of response have you had? Absolutely great response. I get emails every single day from people actually saying, a big, of them, a big part of them actually anonymously from males actually saying that they've got an eating disorder and they don't want to speak out because they've, they're, they're afraid, afraid their family and their friends will turn against them and basically saying to me what they, they can do to actually get help. But like I always say to them, I always say, you've got to speak to whoever you can, anybody you can trust, whether that be a family member, a friend. You've obviously got plenty of online sites you can go to, Be Eat in the UK, men, and men get eating disorders too. They do peer support groups. It's really, really important you actually speak to somebody, anybody you can trust, because that's a big, big part of it, is actually having that support network. And unfortunately, a lot of people out there don't obviously have that. I mean... Do you see from the emails and feedback that you get any kind of pattern in terms of why, you know, people are are having problems with, with eating? Yeah, well, quite a lot of them's obviously been about physical and sexual abuse and things like that in their past. Some people have obviously went down the road, obviously, like you and talked about earlier, like going down like the kind of bigger exia route, the, like the fitness and such likes, getting too muscular, then finding that they, they just have to keep keep going and it's led into an eating disorder. So it's in both sides of the spectrum, really. Yeah, I think the phrase you used, uh, you and actually, uh, probably gives people the best sense of it. It comes from emotional pain. Yeah. You know, and, and obviously people have got their own individual experiences as to where that pain actually comes from. But if we just call that, a, you know, a thing, emotional pain, and this is a way of trying to, to deal with it. I mean, Tommy, have you found other ways of dealing with your emotional pain? Yeah, it's about thinking about the good times and such like. So I always, when the anniversaries like my mum and dad's passing, I go and I celebrate them. I, I just don't get caught up in blaming myself anymore because I know that that was my mum's choice. She wanted to have a family and that's exactly what she did. Obviously as well, my, things like my, my, my vegan lifestyle and things has really, really helped me so, so much. It's like gave me motivation back that mighting disorder took away. It's opened the doors that mighting disorder closed. It's gave me motivation to actually do things and it's taken away that fear of the food and such likes because for me it's just about being just vegan. Everything I had before in a, a standard diet, I now have veganised cakes, anything, pizza. You've got to get in all those calories and that's really, really important. But a lot of people do use it as a way to restrict and such likes because they see fruit and vegetables as low, low calorie. You need a mm. lot of volume in that and for me that's totally, totally wrong. It's like swapping one eating disorder behaviour for another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you and when when people come to you with an eating disorder, are you treating an eating disorder or are you treating emotional pain? Well, you're treating both um, because you have to work with the behaviour because sometimes the behaviour in itself makes it impossible to work with someone's experience. They, you know, eating disorders are incredibly dangerous um, physiologically. And one of the first questions we would look at with anyone who came to see us in one of our first psychology centres would be, you know, should you be coming to something like this or do you really need to go to hospital um, because you know eating disorders depletes the body and affects how we think and perceive things and that's unfortunately part of the cycle we get into with, with severe eating disorders ultimately however once you've identified that the behaviors there and they exist and they can be worked with you are working with the person in their totality they're experiencing and that means working with how they feel their experiences that perhaps have given rise to um, the, the, the eating disorder and you know that's always going to be a, a unique bit of work because everyone's different. So there's no two eating disorders are the same. And you're working with someone who has bringing an emotional life and a set of emotional experiences that can be healed. And mm -hmm. I think it's really important to say that because it's hard sometimes when you're feeling pain to, to feel any hope. And But it can be, can be worked with effectively through good support. And, you know, Tommy's, a, again, a good example of mm -hmm. finding ways of coping, different ways of coping. Mm -hmm. So there is hope, but it's it's... Being prepared to take the risk to seek help, that's the, often the, the hardest thing. Um, and that's the thing, I guess, that I'd really want to sort of echo from Tommy's um, discussion and, and uh, advice earlier. It's, it's being prepared to take, take the risk. And for many men, that's very hard because we are taught to be big and strong, tough guys, 
not to seek help, to do it by ourselves, to take control. So actually being vulnerable and saying, look, I'm struggling here can be incredibly difficult. Yeah. Well, if you want to see living, breathing, bouncing evidence of coming through <laughs> the other side, well, uh, you can catch up with Tommy. Is it Tofu Tommy on YouTube, yes, is it? Yes, OK, I'll give, I'm not supposed to give wee plugs, but I think we can make an <laughs> exception <laughs> in, in your case. Uh, so, and, and it's often a great way online, isn't it? Just to be able to quietly yourself, just sort of connect with somebody like yep. you, Tommy, and maybe other people and just start the process of thinking, do you know what, I really want to change this and I maybe need a wee bit of help to yep. to, to get me there. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure to meet you. Thank you very pleasure much, as well. uh, Tommy Kelly. And uh, Sa uh, Professor Ewan Gillen, thank you very much pleasure. for joining us this morning. Um, right, we're moving on and, and we've got lots of lots... Of Binge on life, purge negativity and starve guilty feelings. Speak to you all soon and love you so much.